Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that we are about to read and the one that we hold in our hand right now because we believe this word has a very power to transform our life. So before we even begin, we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you transform our heart because no one can do it. No pastor can do it. No preacher can do it. But when we hear your word, when we know this is the word of the eternal God, the infinite God speaking to us, it has the power to radically transform not only our mind, but it has the power to radically transform every area of our lives. So we ask that you speak to us. We are ready to hear, Lord, and pray that we be able to truly understand your heart from the message of the book of Hosea. And may we be a people who understand who our God is and how much you love us. And we give you all the highest praise, honor, and glory. In the mighty cross we pray. Amen. Okay, before you sit, uh, why don't you shake hands to your right and say, go and marry and stop there. Okay, don't say the next word, okay? <laughs> go and marry. Okay, go and marry. You may be seated. Especially if you're single, this is a good word for you. Go and marry. Okay. Tonight I want to really talk about um, what I consider the second greatest love story in the Bible. Okay. So we know the greatest love story in the Bible is the story of Jesus and his church. Correct? But tonight is a close second. It's very close second. I, I consider this as the second greatest love story in the whole Bible. In fact, this story is actually the story of the gospel. They're the same. So the story of the gospel is shadowed by this church. I mean, this story. This story is the shadow of the story of the gospel. So everything that happened in this story actually happened in the gospel. So this is a really, really beautiful story. And if you're not familiar with it, I do not blame you. Because not a lot of people talk about the book of Hosea. But if this is your first time hearing the story of Hosea, man, trust me, it's going to radically transform the way you think about our God. And if this is your second or third or fourth or fifth time reading the book of Hosea, Pretend this is your first time. Can we do that? Okay? Pretend you never know the story of Hosea because this story is extremely breathtaking. Now, I want to talk about the idea of love. You know, we all love the idea of love. I mean, all of us, we are drawn to the concept of love. Whether you want to admit it or not, all of us are drawn to the concept, the idea of love. Let me give you the easiest example. Back when I was a kid, uh, you know, it was pre pre-iPad days. You know, there was no iPad, there was no iPhone. So what I do usually to spend my time is I used to play imagination game. Anyone in my, in my era? I used to uh, collect um, action figures, X-Men, Superman, Marvel, Spider-Man, and also Dragon Ball. So what I will do is I will play by myself. You know, I have this, I made up my own story and have this character. And it was so much fun. Like for me, it was so much fun. People were watching like, what do you guys do with you? Like it was so much fun. I spent like an hour or two just, you know, making my own story and um, creating this, you know, Dragon Ball versus Marvel. Okay? And it's awesome. It's awesome. But I can't help to realize that there's something missing in the story. Do you know what's missing in the story? I need a component of love. Somehow the story is not complete without love. So you know what I will do? I will steal one of my sister's Barbie. Okay, my sister have a lot of them. So I will steal one of my sister's Barbie and then use the Barbie in my story. So now it's like Goku versus Spider-Man in order to get Barbie's love. Yeah? Like, this is what the thing that I do. It's, it's so much fun for me. And, um, but the thing about that idea, that longing for love is this. As I grew up, that longing does not go away. It does not fade. In fact, it goes even more intense as I grew up. So like back in the, my days, back in the days, I was happy ha- holding Barbie in my hand. But now I'm not happy with Barbie in my hand. I want Barbie that I can hug, right? So it's different. Like the, the longing is there. So <laughs> come on, guys. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You want a Barbie that you can hug. Of course, you're going to call your girl Barbie. Maybe some of you did. But you want it. There's this longing um, that you want to love and to be loved. And, and the thing about it is, you know, we tried. And this is our story. This is my story. I'm not if your story. This is what happened. So what happened is after puberty hits, I began to fall in love. And then I broke my heart. And then I vow I will never, ever fall in love again. And then I fell in love again. How many of you with me? If, if that's your story, that's my story, okay? Back in the days before Tim was with Elvina, Tim used to say this a lot. You know, this is a really, really good, cool, good quote. He says this, oh, before Elvina, okay, just to make sure. He said, like, guys are stupid. But girls are crazy, okay? And I, I love that, you know? That's a perfect quote to describe a guys and girl relationship. And I love that. But the thing about it is this. You know, you, I, you and I know that we are wired for love. And why is that the case? And I love the quote by Timothy Keller. My favorite author put it this way. 
one of the greatest riddles of human existence and the riddles of our condition is why we absolutely must have a love from others that they cannot give us and others must have a love from us that we cannot give them. You with me? Somehow you, you, you want to receive this love from other people, but somehow you just never be satisfied with the love that you receive. And other people want to receive the same love from you, but somehow you're unable to give it. And this is the riddle of human condition. And what is the answer? The answer is found in the book of Hosea. If I can sum it up, it's like this. All of us are wired to receive and experience the eternal, infinite love of God. And until we have that love, we will never be satisfied. We will continue to pursue it, and all of that need that love. Okay? And tonight, I want us to look at that love in the book of Hosea. But before we go there, let me give you uh, some of the context of the book of Hosea. All right? uh, the book of Hosea is the first book of the 12 minor prophet books. Why are they called minor? It's not because they're not important. They are called minor because in terms of length, it's a lot shorter than the major prophet. The major prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know, the book that you never finish because you really take. So that's, that's the major prophet. And the minor prophet, they're a lot smaller in size, not in terms of quality. So Hosea is the first one, the first book of the, uh, in the minor prophet books. But then um, the book of Hosea is written in the days where Israel experienced the tremendous blessing of God. So they are prosperous. They become rich. They become, you know, very comfortable. They, they experience the blessing of God. But at the same time, it is the worst day of Israel. You know why? Because when Israel experienced all that blessing, they began to pursue after God's blessing, and they neglected God. So this is the message to those people. And that's like my story and your story. Can we agree that a lot of time in our Christian work, we thrive? In difficult days. We thrive in adversity. But in the days of prosperity, we're like, ugh. And that's our story. And to this bunch of people, God will give a strong message through the book of Hosea. Okay? And the book of Hosea is very, very unique. Why is it unique? Because usually, when God speaks, you know what God do? God gave a message for the prophet to speak. Right? For example, Thus said the Lord, let my people go. Remember that story? Moses, so whenever God speaks through a prophet, the prophet will say, thus say the Lord. But however, the book of Hosea is different. Because God wants to deliver his message not only through the words of Hosea, but through the life of Hosea. So two things that happen. Not only the words, but also the life. So God wants Hosea to lift up the life, and that Hosea's life will become the message to the people of Israel. You with me? So now we want to look at his life because his life is very, very interesting. So that's the context of the book of Hosea. And there are two characters. I need you to know. There's only two main characters. Their name is Hosea and Gomer. Okay, there are two characters, just two, Hosea and Gomer. Let me be clear before we even jump to the story. You are not Hosea. Okay, let, let, me, let me just be clear. You are not Hosea, okay? I preached this uh, book on Albert and Kathleen's wedding. And before I even start preaching, I make sure I told Albert really clearly, Albert, remember, you are not Hosea. Otherwise, this is going to be a very, very messed up sermon, wedding sermon. Like, well, you're Hosea, you're marrying a whore. Okay, no, that's really bad, okay? So that's not the case. We are not Hosea. Hosea is a picture of God. And we, who are we in the story? We are Gomer. So three things that happen here. The story, the story is between Hosea and Gomer. But the story at the same time is between God and Israel, but at the same time, it is a story between Christ and us. So three things happen. Hosea and Gomer, God and Israel, and Christ and us. You with me? Okay, you ready? You ready to jump to the story? The story is extremely beautiful, even though he's horrific at the same time. Okay? Let's pick it up in first one. Hosea chapter 1, first one. Now, if you have your Bible, this is time to open up to the book of Hosea. This is what the Bible said. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Beri. In the days of Uzziah, Jotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Okay, what is the word? This is the word. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take, yourself, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. Okay, stop there. Okay, that's a lot of whore in one 
first. This is what happened. So when out of nowhere, the first time Hosea became a prophet, God said, boom, Hosea, I want you to marry a whore. And if I was Hosea, like, what? Marry what? A whore? Come on. I, I tried to imagine myself in the story, okay? So when I graduated from Rolling College in 2020, which is next year, and I'm next year, and suddenly, you know, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And suddenly God spoke to me, Whoo! You see, I want you to go to King Cross, go to Bertel, and find yourself in a Bertel. I'm what, like, what, what, what? God, is this you? Or is this the pizza that I ate? Are you, you with me? Like, imagine that conversation with my dad and my mom. Uh, dad, mom, uh, I don't know how to say this, but uh, I prayed. I prayed, and God told me to go to King Cross and find myself a wife in a Bertel. You know what they do? Because they're charismatic, they, I cast out the spirit of whoredom. Out, out, out! Right? Or they probably fast before the days and forty night. Because it's unheard of. It is illogical. Okay, you know, sometimes people do illogical things in the name of love. But it is unheard of for a prophet of God to marry a whore. It is unheard of. I mean, Hosea probably like, you know, God, I have a reputation to keep. I'm your prophet. But now you want to marry what? A you know, and some commentators, a lot of commentators, try to tone down by saying this. You know what? Maybe in the beginning, Gomer was not a whore. Maybe Gomer just was an ordinary woman, you know, who eventually cheated on his husband, her husband. But that's not the case. If you pay attention to first two, okay, the little Hebrew is very clear. It says this: Go marry a whore, have a children with a whore, because Israel has become a whore to me. It's very clear. So we know from the very beginning, he says, Gomer was a whore. And then now God says, I want you to marry a whore. Okay, this is a radical, radical commandment. Okay, what? And then what happened? What happened is this. What happened is Hosea actually did it. And not only Hosea did it, Hosea actually loved Gomer. Okay, I don't know. I, I have no clue why Hosea would love Gomer. But Hosea did. Because if you read chapter 2, especially chapter 2, you'll feel the tense in the, there's this chapter, like the feeling, the anguish feeling, the emotion of, you know, how painful it is to be betrayed by someone you love. You feel it, like Hosea just feel it. So you know that Hosea loved Gomer. And then, but the weird thing is this, from the very beginning when God gave Hosea the commandment to marry Gomer, God already warned Hosea, Hosea, listen to me, your wife is going to cheer on you. Your wife is not going to be faithful. Your wife is going to betray you. Your wife is going to sleep with another man. Now think about it. If you know your wife, your future wife is going to sleep or going to betray you, would you marry that person? But Hosea married that person. Hosea loved Gomer. Why? Listen to me, why? Here's what happened in the book of Hosea. It's really cool. What God is doing is this. God is saying to Hosea, Hosea, listen to me. You and I, Hosea, both of us, we will experience the pain of loving someone and being betrayed by that person. Hosea, you and I will do everything we can to love a person. We're going to invest a lot of energy. We're going to invest a lot of money. We're going to do a lot of things in order to pursue, to have this woman, to protect this woman. Yet this woman will betray us. And Hosea, my story will be your story. And not only that, Hosea, what you will do with the woman who betray you is what I will do to my people, Israel. So, Hosea, your story will be my story. I will show Israel how much I love them through what happened through you and Gomer. You with me so far? Okay, that's what happened, okay? Let's, let's go on to verse 3. So, he went and took Gomer, the daughter of the blind, and she conceived and bore him a son. Verse 4. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Now, this is really cool. So God is saying this, For every children that Gomer bore, that children will give specific meaning to Israel. Okay? So the first children, his name is Jezreel. Okay, what happened? God is basically saying this. You know, there's a city in Israel called Jezreel. And what happened in this city is there's a, was, there was a king by the name of Jehu who slaughtered 70 sons of Ahab. So, and God was angered because of it. And then God says this, Israel, 
I know what you did in the city of Israel. I remembered. So this is basically, if you like to watch movie, it's God's version of saying, I know what you did last summer. Okay, God is saying to Israel, I know. I know what you did last summer, and I will make sure you pay back. Okay? Continue. So that's the first son. The first son, his name is Israel. Verse 6. And she conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name what? No mercy. Okay, that's a weird name for a daughter. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. But I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow, by bow, by, or by sword, or by war, or by horses, or by horsemen. When she had win no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, what? Not my people. Okay, that's another weird name. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. So now this is what happened. So the first son, his name is Jisrael. But then Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the names of the daughter is Loruhama, which translated what? No mercy. Now think about it. Would any dad call her daughter no mercy? You know, I have no mercy on you, my daughter. No, especially to a daughter. Dad always have soft spot. And then Gomer conceived again. And then the second son called him what? Not my People, low army. So, and this is like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? Let me tell you what happened. There's a hint in the story. Subtle hints at this moment, but there's this hint that tells us it seems like these two children, low army and low rama, no mercy and not my people, are not Hosea's children. So, there's a hint that seems to tell us that it seems like Gome committed adultery, sleep with another man, and then conceive children. Because that's why they call the name what? No mercy and not my son. Now think about it. Will any dad, you know, call us some, you know, no mercy and not my people come. Let's have dinner with daddy. That would be very awkward. You will not name your children that way. But there's a hint. Although at this time we're still not sure if this is just a hint of this is true, that host Gomer has committed adultery. You with me so far? Okay, now let's jump to chapter 2. Okay? Now, in chapter 2, we're going to pick it up in verse 2. Plead with your mother. Plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. That she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst. Upon her children, what? I also will have no mercy. Because why? Because they are children of what? Whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who will give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Pause. So this is what happened. Chapter 2 is a bit weird, a bit hard to understand, because what happened in chapter 2 is this. Hosea's voice and God's voice become one. So when God speaks, it's actually Hosea speaking. When, when Hosea speaks, God speaks. So what happened to them is actually the same thing. So, so let me translate that for you, okay? This is what happened. So what happened is this. Gomer cheated on Hosea. Gomer slept with another man. And then Hosea was heartbroken. And then Hosea found out that the two children are, in fact, are not his children. So we're very clear now. The two children are committed, uh, are, are conceived out of wedlock. So they're not Hosea's children. So probably at this time, Hosea was like, oh my gosh, God's prophecy come true. These children are not mine. Oh my gosh, I knew it. I knew it. God already told me, you know, she will be unfaithful to me. And now it happened. Okay? Hosea Gomer committed adultery. But here's the tragedy. The true tragedy that happened. I will assume usually what happened in this story goes like this. I don't know. In Korean drama, usually what happened is uh, um, someone would flirt with the wife, right? You know, some lonely guys, you know, some youngster, like, oh, you're pretty, you're beautiful. So some guy would flirt with uh, the wife and then somehow earn the wife affection and then they commit, you know, stuff happened. But the story does not go that way. The book of Hosea, Hosea clearly told us the first tragedy is it is not, it is not man who pursue Gomer. It is Gomer who pursue other lovers. So this is the first tragedy. The, the tragedy is this. 
Hosea was Gomer's husband, but Gomer left Hosea, and then Gomer began to pursue after other guys. It's not other guys who pursue Gomer. It's Gomer who left Hosea and pursued other guys. Now, question. If you were Hosea, what would you do? Okay? Let me tell you what I will do, okay? Because I can't speak on your behalf. Let me tell you what I will do. If I was Hosea, I'd be like, that's it, bro. And goodbye. End of story. I will change every lock in my house. I will change my PIN number. I change my password for my email, my Instagram, my Facebook. Anything that's in you, I change it. Why? To make sure she can never ever have any access toward me. And make sure she changes all the lock in the house. Make sure she can never ever return. Why? Listen. God, I love her. I marry you out of obedience. I love her. I have a kid. And then she gave two kids that is not mine. And I take care of them. I love them. But now, Lord, it's too far. She left the house. That's it. Game over. Now I will not, I will not have anything to do with her. No more. Done. And then the book of Isaiah finished there. You with me? That's what I will do. Maybe some of you are more nicer than me. Some of you probably are like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, pro- I'm pretty open-minded to that, maybe. I'm not. I will change every lock in my house to make sure she can never, ever return. But then the story continued. It does not finish there. Verse 6. Therefore, I will hatch up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her that she cannot find her path. And she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall, she, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, blah, blah, blah. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Okay? Again, allow me to explain this to you, okay? I did research on this. You can trust me. What happened in the story goes like this. So, Gomer left the house. Gomer pursued after other lovers. And then what happened in the story is this, okay? So, Hosea found out, apparently, the man who Gomer lived with right now cannot provide for her basic necessity. So right now, uh, we don't know if Gomer lived in an abusive relationship or the man just simply poor. We do not know. But what we do know is that this man cannot provide Gomer with her basic necessity. So Jose heard about it. Okay, so, so Gomer does not have her basic, her basic necessity. Do you know what Jose did? Okay, this is breathtaking, okay? You know what Jose did? The Bible tells us this. Jose went to the man's house. So think about it. So Hosea went to the man who lived with Gomer, went to the house, knocked on the house, and then came up man. I don't know about you, but in my mind, somehow it's like a big, fat man with beer belly, you know, with the uh, belly button showing, like, oh, who are you? What do you want? Okay. And Hosea says, uh, are you the man who lived with Gomer, the daughter of Deep Lime? And the man says, yeah, it's me. What do you want? And Hosea said, I am Hosea, Gomer's husband. Now, what do you think will happen next? Okay? In my imagination, the man will be thinking, oh my God, this is the husband. He's going to kill me now. Okay? And then WWE happened. Whoa, I start wrestling. But that is not what happened in the story. Do you know what happened in the story? What happened is this. When the man finally found out this is Hosea, Gomer's husband. You know what Hosea did? Hosea took out her wallet. Took out his wallet, sorry. Hosea took out his wallet and got some cash out and say, you know what? I heard that you cannot provide for Gomer's necessity. And listen, I do not want Gomer to suffer. Here's the money. Take it to provide for all of her need. And you know what the man did? The man said, oh okay, yes, thank you. The man take the money, and the man purchase everything that Gomer needed, but one thing. The person, this man, never ever told Gomer who actually provided the money. The second tragedy is this. The first tragedy, 
Hosea was Gomer's husband, but Gomer left Hosea for another man. The second tragedy of the story is this. It is Hosea. It was Hosea who provided Gomer with everything she needed. But Gomer thought it was her lover. Gomer thought it was her lover who provided all of her need. That's the second tragedy. Are you with me so far? So this is what happened in the story. Now, I don't know about you, but at this time, I feel like that's it, man. You know, Hosea, you did well. You did enough. You, you, you've been a good man. You provide for her needs even though you don't have to. You, you love the children. You take care of the family. You did well. You did awesome. And then we do not know how long time passed, maybe weeks, maybe months, maybe years. But the story continues, okay? The story does not end. I hope the story ended. But then we have this chapter, Hosea chapter 3. It is what I consider the best chapter in the Old Testament. It is the most beautiful, breathtaking chapter in the whole Bible, even though it is extremely bizarre. Okay, you ready? Hosea chapter 3. Okay, Hosea chapter 3. I don't know how many years has passed, okay? So Hosea probably was living fine, doing fine with his life, you know, taking care of the kids. He's getting used to life without Gomer. Suddenly, chapter 3, verse 1, and the Lord said to me, go Again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loved the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisin. How many of you realize this is illogical comment? This is, I don't know, man. Coast of public, what, 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 what? Go again? Okay, okay. Maybe I can go again to the house. But what God, Lord, Lord, you want me to love her again because you love the people of Israel? Come on. Seriously? Give me a break, God. Like, I don't know if you ever experienced the pain of being betrayed by someone you love. Most of you are not married, so you do not know the pain. But I, I'm not married as well, but I know the pain of being betrayed by someone I love. Okay? When I was 18, uh, I moved to America. I moved to America, and um, I was 18, and I met this girl, Korean. She was 22, and we hang out together, we play together, and out of nowhere, she told me that she liked me. And then I sang her a song, okay? The song goes like this. Don't say you love me, you don't even know me. Right, you know, if you really love me, then give me some time, all right? That basically, I'm only saying the last part, give me some time. I don't sing the first part. Some of you are like, what song is that? It's the Blackpink latest album, right? Check it out. <laughs> give me some time. But then I, I start to consider my option. Well, I'm 18, single. I live in another country on my own, and I don't have a car. And I look at her, she's 22. She has a job, and she has a car. So... Why not? Okay? So that's my love. <laughs> my logic goes like, like, okay, why not? Okay. So we dated. We dated um, only to find out that four months later, I found out four months later that not the only reason, but the main reason she approached me and said she liked me is one, to make her ex-boyfriend jealous. And the moment she succeeded and her boyfriend got jealous and they get together, you know what she did? She dumped me, okay? Let me tell you, it was extremely painful moment, okay? And if at that time, after all that I went through, you come and tell me, yes, I received a word from the Lord. Go and date her again. Let me tell you, I will crucify you upside down. <laughs> there was no way because it's, it's, it is an emotional impossibility. But this is what God said to Hosea. Hosea, listen, Hosea, I know the pain that you endure. I know right now you have 10,000 reasons for you to, be, to get divorced with your wife. I know you've been through a lot, but hear me. I want you to go again and love her again. And to which I'm like, how can that be? And then verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a latak of barley. And I say to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. So this is what happened, okay? These verses is very complex, okay? I need to, in order to understand these verses, I need to read a lot of commentaries. Let me tell you what happened. 
So what happened is this. Apparently, Gomer has fallen down so much in social ladder to the point that she became a slave. Not only she became a slave, what happened is this. She was about to be sold in slave auction. How do we know? Because the price that Hosea paid for Gomer is the price for a female slave. So think about it. This woman who was used to be loved by Hosea, now she became a slave and she was about to be sold in a slave auction. And if you watch a lot of movies, then you will know. You know how they will, you do the slave auction? They will strip her naked, fully naked, no clothes whatsoever. Why? In order for every uh, future buyers might be able to inspect what they're getting. You with me? So they, that's why she was stripped naked. So think about it. Now Gold, Gomer was stripped naked in a slave auction. And here comes Hosea. Hosea had heard about it. Gomer was about to be sold in a slave auction. So Hosea went to the slave auction. And then Hosea saw his wife stripped naked. And then the auction began. And people said, five shekels! And then another person said, no, seven shekels! And another person said, ten shekels! And Gomer's like, man, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I'm doomed. And suddenly, suddenly, he heard a voice. He heard a voice. Eleven shekels! And she's like, wait, that voice sounds familiar. That voice sounds really familiar. I think I know that voice. So she looked up, and do you know who she saw? She saw her husband. And she's like, what is Hosea doing there? Hosea said, 11 shekels. Another person said, 12. Another person said, 14. Another person said, 15 shekels. And then Hosea was said, what? 15 shekels and a half. One and a half barley. And the auction says, sold. The question of the text is this. Now, what will Hosea do to Gomer? Okay? This is a woman who betrayed her. This is a woman who hurt her. This is who, who, the woman who trampled on, her, on his heart and his feeling. What will Hosea do to Gomer? So Hosea saw Gomer. She was naked. So Hosea approached Gomer, clothed Gomer with his clothes, raised her up, and take her away from the slave auction. And now, if you were Gomer, what is in your mind right now? It's only one. Oh no. I knew it. I knew why he bought me. I knew it. He wants what? Revenge. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure he's going to torture me now. I'm pretty sure he's going to do a lot of crazy things to me. Oh my gosh, I'm doomed, I'm doomed, I'm doomed, I'm doomed. But do you know what Hosea did? First three. It is a very complex sentence in Hebrew. That's why if you read many Bible translations, first three is translated very, very differently sometimes. Okay, this is what happened in first three. Okay, just trust me. I did my research. Trust me. In first three, this is what Hosea did, said to Gomer. Basically says this, Gomer, listen. I want you. Not as a slave. I want you as my wife. But listen, Gomer. Listen. From this moment, you will not sleep with another man. You will not give your body to any other man. You are mine. You will not prostitute yourself anymore. But listen, Gomer, at this very same time, listen, I will give my life to you. But for a moment, we will not have sex. For a moment, we will not come together. But when that time passes, I will be fully yours and you will be fully mine. I will restore you to your rightful position. You will be my legit wife and I am yours and you are mine. Full restoration. What a story. And now you think Korean drama is awesome? Read your Bible. This is more than Korean drama. So full restoration. Out of like just like that. Okay. Now, I'm gonna give you three observations. What can we learn about God's love from this story? And I'm gonna give you one, just one application, and I finish. Okay. Three observations. Three observations. Because this is remember, this is Hosea and Gomer, this is God and Israel, and also Jesus and us. My first observation is this: God's love 
is scandalous, okay? Just think about it. There is absolutely no way in your logical mind you will marry someone who you knew will betray you one day. Anyone ever have a dream? I just want to marry a prostitute one day. No, we don't want that. We want a husband and wife who is faithful to us. No one wants to ever marry a whore. None. But listen to me. God, from the very beginning, He knew exactly when He told Hosea to marry Gomer. He knew Gomer was a whore and Gomer will betray him. But the question of the book, listen, the question of the book is not why God commanded Hosea to marry Gomer. The biggest question of the book is this, why on earth did God choose to love and marry Israel? Because God knew from the moment He chose Israel, He knew that Israel would betray Him. Israel would break His heart. Israel would trample on Him. Israel would betray Him. But the question is this, why on earth God chose Israel? Why did God love Israel? Why did not God chose Indonesian? Maybe Indonesians are more faithful than Israel. But God chose Israel despite knowing exactly they will betray Him. But let me tell you, you know, it might offend you. And it's okay. It's in my job description to offend you once a week. Listen to me. You might be offended, but every single person, every nation, every tribe that is not in the covenant relationship with God, in the eyes of God, is a whore. What does it mean? You and I, unless we're in a relationship with God, we are a whore. Paul put it this way. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does it mean? It means this, that in the eyes of God, none of us is pretty. In the eyes of God, none of us is beautiful. None of God deserves His love. Therefore, in order for God to love anything or anyone beside Himself, it is extremely scandalous. Because this love says this, okay? The love of God is the candle. Why? Because the love of God makes the object of His love lovely. He does not love the object because they're lovely. No, he, lo- he loves them and makes them lovely. So with another, it's this. When God loves someone, it's not because they're awesome, because they're strong, because they're pretty. No, God said, you know, you're a whore, but I'm going to love you and I'm going to make you beautiful. That is the love of God. That's why it's extremely scandalous. God does not love you because you're pretty. Not at all. God loves you and he makes you pretty. You with me so far? That's the first thing that we learn about the love of God. The love of God is extremely scandalous. The second, the second thing that we learn is this: God's love is relentless. In chapter two, the hardest chapter I think in the book of Hosea, we found that God is pursuing Israel. As Hosea pursued Gomer, God is pursuing Israel. God will not give up on Israel. But here's the question. Do you know how God pursued Israel? You know, God did not send chocolate and flowers. That's not what God did. You know how God pursued the love of Israel? God allowed Israel to experience the pain and suffering of sin. God allowed Israel to experience the, the devastating effect of sin. God pushed Israel to the corner, to the point that Israel finally can't breathe anymore. Israel in a lot of pain. Finally, to the point that Gomer will say this, you know what, maybe I was wrong. I realized today that my life with my first husband was so much better. And this is the love of God. This is the pursuing love of God. This is the relentless love of God. He will discipline you. God's discipline is a picture of God's relentless relentless love toward you. But we do not like it. God's discipline is God saying, you know what? I refuse to give up on you even though you walk away from me. I refuse that's why I'm going to corner you. It's like this. Sometimes we find it very hard to understand this love, okay? In order to help you understand, I'm going to bring little Yo-Yo into the story. If you're new with us and you do not know who little Yo-Yo is, he's my kid. He's my children in the future. He's my future kid. So let's say one day I went, sh- I went to the mall with little Yo-Yo, okay? I went to the mall with little Yo-Yo. And like every other kid, every time that we go to the mall, they always want to look for one thing. What? 
Toys. I want toys. I want toys. Toys, toys, toys. Okay, fine. Okay, let's look at some toys. So we went, and then, and then little Luya looked at these toys that cost $10. And said, Daddy, I want these toys. I want these toys. And you know what's, Ch- uh, what's the child's favorite word? Now. Right? They just like, I want it now. Now. And I'm like, uh, little Luya, here's the thing. Okay? Daddy not going to buy you this $10 toy today. Why? Because daddy is about to buy a house. It costs daddy one million dollars. Okay, little you smart, so he count. How many zeros? Okay, ten dollars, how many zeros? One. One million? Six. Wait, daddy. You have six zero, and you don't want to use one zero to buy from me toys? You know what little you will say? Daddy, you do not love me. But here's the thing. Little yo-yo, you don't understand. The house that I'm about to buy for you, for our family, the $1 million house will give you so much more than that $10 toy can give you. But because little yo-yo is a kid, little yo kind of said, no, you do not love me, daddy. You don't, why don't you buy me a toy? You have the money. Why don't you buy me a toy? And that's a lot of time how we look at the love of God. You know what is our problem? Here's our problem. The problem with us is this. The problem with us is... We, our problem with understanding God's love is that we often have a child-sized view of the love of God. Sometimes we think about God's love the way children try to understand the parents' love. And they don't. They don't get it. Child, a child cannot understand, cannot fathom their parents' love. Here's the thing. If a child cannot understand their parents' love, love what makes you think you can understand the love of the infinite God while you're just a finite being. The, the love of God is so much more grandest and bigger than you can understand. What makes you think you can understand His relentless, relentless love toward you? Okay? And my third point, my third observation is this. God's love not only scandalous, God's love is not only relentless, the third thing, God's love is Priceless. In the story of Hosea, so Gomer became a slave. Gomer lost her beauty. Do you know what the name Gomer means? Perfect. It probably uh, a reference to her physical beauty. She was perfect in every way. But now she became a slave. She lost her beauty. She's just someone with no word whatsoever. But here come Hosea. And Hosea come what and purchase Gomer. Do you know what? How much Hosea has to pay? Everything he has, because he can't even afford thirty shekels. So he, this is what he said: All I have is fifteen shekels of silver. But here's what I have: one and a half jelly, something like that. I forgot what it's called. Hormi, holy, something like that. Harley, barley. Here you go. One and a half barley. That's all I have. I only have this. But when you counted the amount together, it's actually equal to 30 shekels of silver. So this is what happened. So I said, I do not have the money, but I'm going to give everything I have in order to purchase Gomer. Do you know what it means? It is the picture of God's love toward you and me. He says this, no matter what the cost, I will buy you back. And I will get you back, no matter what the cost. You know, for Hosea, it costs her, it costs him everything that he has. Here's the logic that I don't understand, though. Can we agree? It is one thing to forgive one silly mistake that he did or she did intentional, unintentionally, but it is another thing to continually forgive a mistake that he or she did intentionally. Can we agree on that? Gomer continually, intentionally betray Hosea. But Hosea, you say what? Everything I have for her, I want her. And that is what Jesus did for you and me. Jesus says, okay, some of you are like, wait a minute, I don't see Jesus. Let me show you where Jesus is, okay? In, in verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, this is what it said. For the children of Israel shall dwell with many days without king of prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without effort or household gods. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, 
and David their king, and they shall come in fear of the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Okay? This is what happened. This is basically what Hosea said to Gomer, and now God is saying to Israel. Listen, just like Hosea said to Gomer, for a moment, I'm going to stay away from you. For a moment, I'm not going to sleep with you. For a moment, I'm not going to have sex with you. This is God saying to Israel. Israel, for a moment, I'm going to keep my distance with you. For a moment, I'm going to stay away from you. But when that time passed, listen, Israel, you will return to me. You will return to your God. And not only your God, you will return to who? David, your king. Now, here's the trivia. Is David alive at this time or not? No. David is long dead. So what does it mean? You will return to David? What does it mean? It is a prophecy about another David, the son of David. And do you know what happened? This is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus went to the slave auction. He saw you naked there. He saw you stripped naked. He said, I love her. I want her. I'm going to purchase her, and I'm going to make her mine. But here's the question. What does it cost Jesus to buy you and me? It costs Hosea everything. Do you know what it costs God to buy you and me? At the night before crucifixion, Jesus says this. You know the story. In the Gethsemane, Jesus was on his knee. He said this one thing to God. God, I know that you are all powerful. Father, I know that you can do all things. I know that you are almighty. I know that you can. You can do whatever you want. God, Father, is that possible? Is there any other way for me, for us to love these people without paying this price? Is there any other way for us to love these people without me having to go to what I need to go to in the next 24 hours? Is there any other way for me, for us to love these people, to purchase the people without the cross? Is there any other way to purchase these people without my blood? And do you know what God the Father say? No. Son, this is the only way. This is the price. And you know what Jesus did? He bought you with his blood. He bought you with his blood. Not only bought you. From that moment, he said what? I'm going to make you mine. I'm going to cover you with my righteousness. And from that moment, you and I are called what? The bride of Christ. We are the bride purchased by the blood. That's what Jesus did for you and me. And that's the story of Hosea. Okay. I'm going to close with this. Illustration, application, question. Now, think about it. Do you know what happened to you when you have Jesus as your spouse? Because that's what happened. Jesus became your husband, you become his wife. Do you know what happened when Jesus became your husband? Okay? Husband and wife. If you're married, you know this. Okay? If you're married, then you will know that your spouse has a powerful effect on your life that can radically transform your self-value in life. Let me give you an illustration. I'm not married, so I'm going to use Edric and Ellis. Okay? So this is what happened. Let's say one day, Edric uh, was preaching. And he preached really well. He preached awesome. He was preaching like, poof, just super awesome. And then one of you came up to Edric and said, you know what? Oh my gosh, Edric, you are the best preacher that I know. You are so awesome, man. Today you're just right on, man. You're like the best man I know, the best preacher that I know. I think you should replace that hoodie guy who tried to look young and become the new rock scene international pastor. I think you're right. This church will go so much further with you leading the church. And you know, you're like the best preacher. Pastor, preacher ever, Edric. You're the band. Like, you know how Edric will feel? Edric will be, feel, will be, you know, he will be happy. He'll be excited. Oh, yeah. You know, and of course, you say, you know, all glory to God, you know. Okay, of course, okay. He do that, okay. But he will be happy, you know. It's awesome. I'm great. I'm good. But here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Eventually, where out. Because Edric will think this well, that guy doesn't really know me. That girl doesn't really know me. Because let me tell you 
a secret about pastor, preacher. What a lot of time what you see on Sunday is not what you see on Monday. On Sunday, you see me like, oh, energetic, charismatic, you know. On Sunday, you see me with tank top, boxer. Ugh. So no matter what you say, it has its effect. It makes me happy, but not for long. But let me tell you, it's another different story. If Alice approached Edric and say, husband, sayang, sigh, Edric, Listen to me. You are the best preacher ever. Oh, no, that's a lie. You are second best after Yossi. Okay? You're awesome. You're just like the best man I know. You're just like amazing. I never met someone as kind as you, as beautiful, no, as handsome as you, as kind hearted as you. You're just the best thing ever happened to any girl. You know what will Edric feel? Edric will be, Poof! he'll feel like a champion. You know why? Here's why. Because Edric and I, we can fool you on Sunday. We can fool you. Edric can easily fool you on Sunday, but Edric cannot fool Alice. It does not matter. Listen. Every single person in the world can tell you that you are ugly. Let me reverse that. Every single person in the universe can tell you that you're awesome, that you're beautiful. But if your spouse say you're ugly, you feel ugly. But every single person in the universe can tell you you're ugly. But if your spouse say you're awesome, you feel awesome. That's the power of a spouse. Okay, now let me draw this illustration to our relationship with Christ and us. Christ, your husband. Do you know what he say over you and me today? He says this first. He says, I love you with a scandalous love. What does it mean? He says this, even though you betray me, even though you forsake me, even though you will cheat on me, listen, I love you. And my love for you has nothing to do with your goodness. It's because I have chosen you and I decided I'm going to love you. I'm going to make you pretty. And not only the love of God is scandalous, Jesus is, my love towards you is relentless. No matter what you've done, I will continue to pursue you. I will continue to run hard after you. I will let you know, I will never ever let anyone touch you. Even if anyone's going to hurt you, it's going to be me because I want you back. And not only God's love is relentless, the third thing God loves say, he is priceless. Jesus said, what does it cost for me to buy you? My life, here you go. My blood, here you go. Take it. So if I can sum up the book of Hosea, the message of the book of Hosea is this. You, you, you can run from God, but you can never hide from God. The love of God will find you wherever you are. You can try as hard as you can to run as far as you want, but listen, you never, never can outrun God's love for you. And His love for you has nothing to do, listen, nothing to do with your goodness. His love for you has everything to do with the fact that He has decided to love you in His sovereignty. And this is the way Hosea put it, okay? This is the way God put it in Hosea 11. I love this verse. Hosea 11 verse 8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make, make you like Atma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recalls within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. Do you know what God says? Listen, listen. God says to you over me, I cannot give you up. I cannot give you up. I cannot surrender you. I cannot let you go. And it reminds me of one song. Okay? The song says like this. Jesus, you do not want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. And let me tell you, this is scandalous to say. How can a perfect holy God say, you know what, I'm not going to be happy unless you're with me. He's good, He's perfect, He's holy. And that's true. God is happy in the eternal past. He will be happy in the eternal future. The good news of the gospel is this. God does not need you. But God wants you. He tied up his joy to your joy to the point he says, unless you are fully mine, I will never be satisfied. Unless I have you in my joy, I will never be satisfied. That's the way God loves you. And here's my one question, and I finish. If this 
is how Jesus loved you. If this is how your ultimate spouse think of you, if this is how God thinks of you, my question is this. Why do you care what the world think of you? The song said clearly, we have ultimate spouse and his name is Jesus and his name is what a wonderful name. What a beautiful name. What a powerful name. The name of Jesus. And he say, he love you. That is the book of Hosea. Let's pray. So God, I pray tonight for many of us in this place, maybe we never experienced that scandalous, relentless, priceless love of Christ. And tonight I ask you, Lord, that you refill that to us. That you make your love known to us. And I know for many of us tonight, Lord, as we listen to your word, I know that the Holy Spirit, that you stir that fire in our heart. You stir that fire in our heart, that our heart's burning right now. So tonight, my friend, if any of you in this place that you never, ever, ever give your life to Christ, maybe you're a church goer, so you've been attending church, but you never, never experienced this kind of love that God has for you. I pray that tonight you will not harden your heart, but you say to him, Lord, I want that love. I want that love. I want that love that continues to pursue me no matter what the cost. I want that love that already tells me that I've been bought with the blood, precious blood of Christ. And for many of us tonight, or maybe in this place, that we understand your love, but we are like Gomer. We betray you. We walk away from your love. We neglected you. We chase after other things. We chase after sex. We chase after money. We chase after power. We chase after all the things of this world. Tonight, I pray that you continue to pursue us continue to corner us, continue to discipline us, infant, continue to put us in pain in order for us to be able to understand and see the empty promise of the world and realize that we have in you, what we have in you was so much better. And I pray that you tonight, you will not let us be comfortable. Pursue us. Chase us until we are fully yours. And God, I ask this, only you can do this Holy Spirit so I pray that you continue to pursue us until we are yours and we ask this in the name of beloved Son Jesus Christ we pray Amen